what's the biggest challenge you see right now? What's the biggest challenge and what's, what's most urgent? Dr. Shivian? I, I think the biggest challenge is the separation that most people feel from the environment, that the environment is outside of us, uh, that uh, human beings are not part of it. And, and therefore, uh, we can uh, degrade oceans and the atmosphere and soils and dump stuff into our food and uh, without those things having any impact on us whatsoever. Um, and, and therefore, I mean, that's, that's been at the heart of my work, that is to try to help people uh, establish their relationship to the environment by talking about how our health depends on it. Um, and I guess the other issue for me is, and it's sort of part and parcel of it, is that these issues of climate change, loss of biological diversity, what's happening in the Amazon, what's happening to the oceans, are all so abstract for people and so hard for them to grasp. I mean, we walk here from Harvard Yard. The flowering pears are in bloom. The magnolias are coming out. The trees are budding. Birds are starting to sing for the spring. It's a gorgeous day. The grass is coming up. How could anything be wrong? And I, I think that uh, Things like climate change, loss of biological diversity are happening on global scales. They're happening slowly over time. It's very, very hard for people to grasp the reality of them, especially for people living in wealthy industrialized societies. And I think that's part of what makes the United States especially so vulnerable to people who deny that climate change is happening because it's so hard to see it's so hard to experience in our everyday lives. So for me, in some ways, it's that, given the, that I'm a social psychologist, it's, it's that disconnect with the environment that in, in some ways is at the heart of the crisis for me. I would, I mean, I would completely agree with you. And, and looking back at the 70 odd years since my grandfather started, exploring the oceans and at a time when really the oceans were still a surface. We didn't know what was there. It was vast, it covers 70% of our planet. It's deep, it's cold, it's scary. Um, he, he revealed so much to us and we've learned more in the past 70 years than we have ever at any other time in human history. It also, in that time, we've lost more of the oceans than ever before in human history. And it's not just the oceans, it's our planet, it's our forests, it's our lakes, it's our, um, our cultures, um, our indigenous cultures, our ethnosphere is being degraded as rapidly as our biosphere, as rapidly as our hydrosphere. And, uh, and I think not only are we disconnected from it, but we are so ignorant as to how all of it fits together and how our choices that we make every day as we go through our daily rituals has far-reaching consequences for people on the other side of the world, people we can't even imagine that we'll never meet, who live lives that are beyond our imagination. It, uh, it is, a, and, and it's something that everybody is guilty of. I would go to these really, really, really remote villages in Panama and Costa Rica, working with disenfranchised, sustainable, um, um, small-scale fishermen. And really, guys who went out in a very small boat and would catch a little bit of fish for, for their community, and they have nothing left to fish. It's all been fished out. And I would go with other environmentalists from other groups who were there working with me on finding sustainable alternatives for these communities. And we would leave the communities and go and have a meal together in, in a village nearby. And they would order the same species of fish that had been wiped out because of over, like, too much demand and not enough management. And say, but why, how can you eat that? 
you eating that is contributing to the problem that you're trying to solve that we were actually trying to solve three hours ago. There's a complete disconnect, even within groups right. of people who are trying to solve the issue. Um, two years ago, I was interviewed by a French senator in Washington, D.C., who was interviewing me about the role of science in sustainable fisheries. My first question to him was, um, this is the first time you've considered the role of science in the management of sustainable fisheries? Really? But yes, it was. And, and so we talked for, at length. We talked about all sorts of things. And I said, has it occurred to you guys, maybe you've had a discussion about how the European fleets that are overfishing the western coast of Africa may be contributing to the illegal immigration of those communities that have nothing left. And so you're spending billions of euros a year on your coast guards and your defenses and shipping these people back home if they survive the journey that they've undertaken to try to find an alternative to what has been taken from them. Oh no, we never considered that. Hmm, that's an interesting thought. Two weeks later, um, there was a investigative journalism piece that was both in the International Herald Tribune and the New York Times, just by chance. But I think that it's really indicative of this disconnect that we feel from nature, but this inability to understand the cycle that starts happening because of our choices, both in our communities and at the global level. And, um, and I think that if we focus there, if we're able to move the needle on the conversations that we're having um, by giving people an opportunity to participate in those discussions in a way that lets them, through media, through the internet, experience some of these things for themselves and have a voice in the decisions that are being made, maybe we can, we can shift the tide. But it's not just the environmentalists who are going to solve the problem. It has to be a concerted effort from all parties, where everybody has an opportunity, whether it's government or industry or environmental groups or communities or indigenous groups, that they all have a place at the table and they're all invited to be part of the solution because we exclude each other all too often. Well, he talks about the Epitobates frog from the rainforest of coastal Ecuador. Uh, the source of one of the most promising pain-killing agents known, non-addictive, potentially a billion-dollar market. The frogs functionally extinct in the wild because of deforestation and drying out in the area. If you look at the coral reefs that Alexander and her family has done so much to bring to public attention, cone snails uh, are disappearing all over the coral reefs of the world, and they're the source of another completely different peptide painkiller. So what may be disappearing in the meantime? If you look at my buddy Paul Cox's work, who was a colleague of mine at the Botanical Museum, he found two elderly female shamans in America and Samoa using a local rubber plant to treat viruses. And this was tested at the National Institutes of Health against AIDS. Now, the AIDS virus is cleared from your bloodstream by the AIDS cocktail, but it seems to take refuge in your spinal cord, and when it develops resistance or you stop taking the cocktail, it comes back out. What this stuff seems to do is either go in the spinal cord or tease the stuff out and then kills it. Now this is from two elderly women who had no apprentice. So if this middle-aged Mormon white boy hadn't gone there and found this stuff, we might not have it. So protecting the environment is in everybody's self-interest in a real medical and I would say industrial and agricultural way. The greatest threat to our species in terms of sustainability, well-being, human life, quality of life, is not global warming is not nuclear war, is not rainforest deforestation, it's drug-resistant bacteria. Remember that bacteria like to have sex even more than college students. <laughs> they swap genes all the time. And if Staph aureus, which has more weapons than the Batmobile, swaps genes with strep, which is flesh-eating bacteria, it's going to melt the human race like a wax museum on fire. So where are we going to get the antibiotics of the future? Well, I believe that history predicts the future. And in the internet age, in the biotech age, 80% of all antibiotics still come from nature. What's the richest source of life on Earth? The Amazon. What's number two? The coral reef. 
So we need to know that when we are destroying Mother Nature, we're destroying ourselves. But until people get that, they will still act stupidly, self-interested, look at beautiful flowers along the Charles River and think, who cares about the Amazon or the coral reefs or the tundra or anything else? But here's something that's more important, the utilitarian approach to the environment, and that is the spiritual approach to the environment. We all pay a mental price <laughs> and a spiritual price when the world we live in is degraded. And I've had this argument plenty of time with politicians in Washington where they say, well, extinction is a natural process. Well, I don't care about the pinheads and the buttheads who think that, well, dinosaurs went extinct, so what? I don't want to live in a world inhabited only by cockroaches and pigeons. And I don't imagine many people here do. Furthermore, the shamans around the world are the technicians of the spiritual realm. As a shaman told me, you know what kills white people? Worrying about worry. Western medicine is the most successful system of healing ever devised. But it ain't <clears throat> real good in dealing with emotional and spiritual issues. I've seen shamans cure acid reflux in 15 minutes. I challenge anybody here from Harvard Medical School to do that. So, there's things that these people know that we don't know, and you can call it the placebo effect, you can call it the spiritual effect, you can call it the magical effect, you can call it the hallucinogenic effect. I don't care. I'm interested in results much more than process. And we destroy these forests and we destroy these cultures at our peril. So sustainability is not just about plant and animal species. It's about our well-being right here and right here. I think I'll just add something to this, um, <clears throat> the big challenge question. And uh, from my perspective, I think our biggest challenge is um, our rapidly declining stock of critical thinking. And it is a malady that has struck my business. Um, I just was, uh, you know, in, 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 in covering these issues, one tends to travel a bit, and I, I'm always amazed when I'm, I just came from South Africa, where there are a plethora of newspapers, and even with the government owning uh, one of the major networks, the level of discourse about what's going on in the society is way above what we have here. I'm willing to wager that if I were to go turn on a television set, I might uh, at this moment uh, uh, find something about maybe an extreme makeover for a house or, um, you know, nothing except maybe if it was on politics, it would be a bunch of people sitting around opining about what's happening. No real reporting, but uh, uh, almost like an ongoing, you know, professional wrestling is all a fake thing. I think sometimes the political wrestling we see on cable television is another fake thing. You've got somebody on the left, somebody on the right, and they're constantly throwing uh, one-liners and stuff at each other. The cost of this is critical thinking. We are dumber than we used to be collectively. I bet any student here at Harvard 100 years ago when Mr. Lowell started this thing would know how to grow his or her own food, would know how, um, you know, how, how to balance life and connections, would have a place that they uh, appreciate that is wild, would have good relationships with people around them, actually know people they could talk to. You know what's happened in America? So many people in America don't have two people outside of their family that they could actually share something that's personal and difficult with. So how do you have a spiritual path if you can't even go to somebody you love and trust and ask the big questions? So we're here collectively. Um, I guess the other challenge um, that I will put out from, uh, that, that's so difficult, um, is that we have created um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of robots that are really out of control. Now, when I first heard, uh, you know, the questions posed, what happens when the robots take over? I thought people were talking about machines. But what we really have on the planet that are robots that have taken over are legal entities known as corporations. They cannot die unless they make an error, but if they don't make any errors, they live forever. And they are relentless in what they do. 
and they have only one task, and that is to keep getting bigger and more profitable. And sooner or later, I don't know, again, actually the math that I took, I think my section met downstairs here, I did not find in that math class that it was possible to keep infinitely growing any kind of set without running into a collision. And yet, we have given so much of our power over to these legal robots that just keep going on and on and demanding more. And I think um, the latest bit, of course, is our Supreme Court saying, hey, the robots are allowed to uh, engage in, uh, in, in politics. And as much dough as they can get out of their machinery into politics, they will be able to spend. That really scares me. Uh, because if, we, if, our, if our critical thinking continues to descend into uh, paying more attention uh, uh, to what color the car we're going to buy or whether or not um, this cola is more slimming than that, um, we're not going to respond to these issues that have been put out here. So um, at some point, some point, sometime soon, um, we have to call the system to account, um, or we'll just keep, we'll just all go to work for the robots. I don't know, you make your choice. <laughs>